Wherever you are around the world today, it's great you can be here with us. Well, as many of you would know, through Lent, the team and I, we travel to different places to give Lenten missions in parishes and in churches all over the place. And right now we are in the middle of a Lent mission in a parish by the name of Good Shepherd. And the way we record is we deliver in the church and then we come back into our studios and we record even more and that gets sent to every single person in the parish. Well, this is one of those recordings that was just only released and just done this week. And I pray this really blesses you. And the reason I wanted to share it with all of you in Impactors online is because I think this is a message as we reach into Lent that I pray will touch your life. It certainly has touched mine. Well, hello everybody. It's great to be with you in this third week in our mission. Well, let's talk about where we've been up to now. We started by talking about in the very first week about needing faith, that if God was to speak to us and speak to us by Easter, that we would need faith. That faith comes from what is heard and what faith comes from, from begging God to increase our faith. Then last week we talked about Jonah and we read Jonah chapter one and and God says to Jonah, hey, Jonah, what I want you to do is I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to tell those people, stop behaving that way. But what Jonah does is he doesn't head in the direction of what God calls him to do. He heads in the opposite direction and he heads towards Tarshish. And the Scriptures say he walks away from the presence of the Lord. And we could say that the presence of the Lord is when we're doing what God wants us to do. We're in the presence of the Lord. And when we walk away from what God asks us to do, the effect of it is this, is that impacts upon us. It robs us of peace and joy, even though at the time we might think we're, we're feeling happy about it, but it will not in the long run. But certainly when we run away from the presence of God, doing the things that we're meant to be doing in our life, and that looks so different for so many of us, it has an astounding effect upon everyone else. So, if you, so if you were to watch the first part of last week's message and then you add on what we're about to talk on now, you'll get one talk all around Jonah, which is part of this much bigger talk where we're talking about what would happen if God was to speak to us um, by Easter. Well, we're going to start reading from chapter, uh, chapter 2. Now, the very last verse of chapter 1, it says that the, the Lord provided a large fish the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and for three nights, right? So here he is, he's in the fish. Now it's a great story, but do you think it's true? Do you think that a big fish came along and swallowed Jonah or do you think the writer is trying to tell us something? I think the writer is trying to tell us something. Um, that, and, and it's this, is that God's after a relationship with us. And when we walk in the direction of what God is saying to us, we experience peace and wholeness. And if when we walk in the opposite direction to what God is asking us, we find a great lack in our life that affects others as well. For so many of us, the only way God sometimes can reach us is through tough times. And what do I mean by that? It's sometimes, it's only in the tough times when we feel dependent upon God. When I started in this ministry years ago, I never dreamt it would be what it is right now. Uh, I, I didn't. And, and, and there have been times when this has been awfully tough, when we haven't had enough to feed ourselves, to, uh, whether it be me, the staff or any of us. And yet it's in those occasions when we haven't had enough where we've come back and we've said, is this what God is saying to us? And being able to say, yes, it is, that we have found faith. The faith that builds within you, the faith that comes from hearing. And so often it is the only time when we, get, we are beyond our own resources and our own capacity that we allow God to work in our life. It's only in the tough times. Well, uh, what's the metaphor of being swallowed by the whale? He comes along and he gets swallowed by the whale and he's there for three days and for three nights. See, sometimes it's in the dark places of our life 
where we become the most honest with ourselves. Sometimes it's in the, those lonely places. It's sometimes it's in the places where we're staring down defeat or even when we have been defeated that we are reachable in the content of our heart. I don't know about you, but thing, when things go well, I don't tend to look toward God as much, well, I didn't used to, as much as when things were going poorly, when, you could, when things didn't add up that you turn and fall before God and say, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me. But when everything's going well, you don't tend to, do you? And what's, what's God about, about? What's God's purpose in making us? God wants us to share in his blessed life. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. And so we're going to read chapter two and, and we're going to look at Jonah in the belly of the whale and what's the thought process that goes through in his mind. Many of you will know this. You, many of this will, you'll know this from your own lives and what has happened in your life, that God uses quiet places. God uses dark places to bring us to the place where we're meant to be. And so if that's where you are today, if you're feeling in a lonely place, if you're feeling in a dark place, if life is tough right now, can I say this to you? You are ripe for God. You're right for God to be able to come and talk to you because God takes nothing and he makes something. God takes closed doors and he opens doors. He opens them to new things that we could never have dreamed, dreamed of. So I'm going to read the story of Jonah chapter 2. And I, and I remind you that if you're thinking, well, I missed the first part, I would encourage you to go back and watch the, the first uh, part of session 2 and then come back and watch this. As well. So it says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The waters surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Jonah is down. He's feeling depressed. And he comes to God. And let's read it again. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I call to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me. What he, what's he saying is, when I was low, when I had nothing else, when I was beyond my resources, I called to God. And there are some of you that are listening right now and you're in that place where the only hope you have is to call to the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, uh, I called to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, out of the dark place, I cried. And you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me and all your waves and billows passed over me. When we reject God, when we turn against God in our life, sometimes God allows us to get to these places of dev devastation and despair. And then it goes on and, he, and it says, then I lay, then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you, O Lord, yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. What he's saying is this, what he's saying is this, I was, I, was, I, was, I was lost, I was in a hopeless place, I was in a dark place, I had run from going to Nineveh, I had gone to Tarshish because I didn't want to do what God wanted me to do. And here I am, this is my life, this is the dark place uh, I am. It then goes on and it says in verse 7, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. 
And what he says is just at the last moment when, when I was lost, when I was desperate, when I was at the end of my resources and all I could do, I thought to myself, what have I got to lose? I'll pray to you. I've met many people like that who, who, who say, well, I'd done everything I could and then I prayed. Then I came to you. Um, well, uh, it's into that place that God wants to come. And so if you right now are in that place of quiet, you're in that place of despair, you're in the place where God will come to you right now. In verse 8, it says, Those who worship vain idols forsake their true identity. What's that mean? Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. Here's me, right? What's an idol? If this is God and this is me, an idol is anything that you put between you and God. An idol is anything you put between you and God so that you block God. And it's so easy to do it. It's so easy to do it. Um, we, we put things that are important before what God is asking of us, what God is asking for us. When I was a, a young boy, I was raised in a family of uh, four, five boys. I was a middle child. There were two older brothers to me. There were two younger brothers to me. And if you saw my four brothers, all of them are kind of dark skinned. They're dark and tanned and, and, and they're kind of strong. And, my, and then there's me. And, 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 and right now, this incredible body is not necessarily all muscle, shall we say. But my brothers were excellent at sport. But me, I was terrible. Um, uh, we, I was terrible at sport. I never did well at all. And, and all of my brothers, they won trophies, not just in their school. They won kind of district uh, uh, trophies. Me, I only ever won one trophy in my entire life. And it was in little athletics. It was in under 13s. There were two boys in, the, in our school that were in Little Athletics and I was the second one. And what I did was I got a trophy for being runner up. If there had been a third person, I wouldn't have got that prize. I value that trophy greatly because it's the only trophy that I've ever had in my life. Well, I would look at my brothers and they were strong and they'd win prizes, but I was different to them. My dad, my dad, who loved me greatly, he would often say to me, he'd say, listen, your brothers have taken after my side of the family. They're all athletic and, well, you've taken after your mother. I'm kind of fair-skinned and, and, and my mum wasn't in a sport, my dad was in a sport. And what it made me feel is that I didn't fit in. And the older I went and the longer I went, I, I, I began to think to myself, you know, it's because, it's because of how I was born. You see, when I was born, I was born with a, a cleft lip, a, 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 a hair lip. My, my, it wasn't joined. And, and, and it had a devastating effect on me. It had a devastating effect on me because I, I kind of believed that I was different to everyone else because other people didn't look like me. I've got crooked teeth. Back in those days, it wasn't like the dental stuff is today where it gets done through the government and schools. No, no, back in that day, your parents had to pay for it. And my mum and dad, we, they were migrants to the country. They didn't have a lot of money. And so they weren't able to get my crooked, missing uh, teeth fixed. And so whenever I looked in the mirror, what I looked at was I looked at someone who was, well, looked damaged. Looked, looked, you know, looked defeated. Looked someone who just didn't measure up like everybody else. And, and, and I didn't initially understand it. It wasn't until I went to school. And how many of you know that school can be a cruel place with all those little boys and little girls who are very happy to point out to each other those things that are different. And they were very happy to point out to me that I was different, that my teeth were different, that I had scars on my face, that I was different. And, and I went through school and, and, and I began to believe when I was at school that I came from a family where if you went into our lounge room loaded with trophies and there was my one runner-up trophy that I only got because there were two of us. And I began to believe to myself that, that I wasn't worth anything. 
I wasn't worth anything because they were worth far more than me. And then people were very happy to point out to me what was different about me, what was different. And, 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 and as the years go by, I, I began to sabotage myself because the one thing that I grew up believing is that I wasn't successful I, and I wasn't ever going to be successful for this reason. I looked like this. And, and, and I had this, and what marked me tremendously the older I got is that I began to think through what was my mum's reaction on the day that I was born? What was it like on that day when I was born? And, and, and if I haven't played this movie in my mind 10 million times, it's because I've played it in my mind 15 million times or so it feels. I can remember, I, I can remember uh, what the room was that, I was that I was born in, the labour room, the delivery room. The truth is I can't, but I fictionalised one in my mind. I can't remember what it was like. And I remember, that, I remember being born and I remember them picking me up and giving me to my mum. And the very first thought she had was when she saw me, she looked at me and she was disapp disappointed. She looked at me and she was disappointed. And, 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 and I played this over in my mind over and over and over. It was never said. My mum never felt that way to me. My mum treated me beautifully and gorgeously and loved me to bits. But I didn't treat myself like that. And my thought was that my mum just saw me as a disappointment. My dad, if you knew him, he was a tough man, a smart man, and he loved us ferociously. But my, ma my dad was able to fix so many things, but he couldn't fix me. And I had this thought when my dad eventually came and saw me for the first time that he, he was just disappointed and I was different and so I, and I, so I believed that I was not loved in the same way that my four brothers are. And now as I began to get older and now as I began to be a child and now when it comes to things that in a boy family you valued in those days, which was sport, I didn't measure up because the truth is it had nothing to do with how I looked or what had happened to me. I was just not sporty. It was as simple as that. There were many people better than me as there is. But I began to play over in my mind over and over and over that I didn't measure up. As so I went through high school and I could tell you stories about how I treated myself in high school because I believed I didn't measure up. Well, I ended up getting married at 23 and that was a shock to me that someone would marry me. And, and I remember we'd been married about a year. And then one day, Rosemary and I, we had a raging argument, a big argument. And I remember, and I remember Rosemary walked out of the room, you know, probably none of you ever have arguments, but Rosemary and I did. And I remember Rosemary walked out of the room and, 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 and then Rosemary came back in the room and she said to me, she said, when I first met you, you used to walk around all the time and you used to say this, I'll survive, I'll survive, I'll get by. And she said, no matter what you were facing, whenever it was difficult or it was hard, your phrase would always be, I'll survive, I'll survive, I'll get by. And she said to me, we've been married one year now and now what you've, no I don't know if you've noticed, but you've started saying, we'll survive, we'll get by. And she said, I didn't get married to get by. I didn't get married to survive. She said, she said we're, we're in trouble. And she said, it's all because you're broken. You're broken. And I knew I was but I didn't know what to do. See, because I had listened to some little girls and some little boys who had said to me that I was weird, I was different, I was strange, who were prepared to point out to me that which was different. And I believed them. I believed them. I believed them. Well, Rosemary then said to me, and by now I, we were standing in our bedroom and I, I, I was 24 years old. And I was standing there, but now I was crying and, and, and crying because I knew what Rosemary had said was true. I was broken, but I didn't know how to fix myself. I was, I was sabotaging success and happiness 
because I believed in a movie that I had played over in my mind over and over and over and over and over again. I believed it. And, and then Rosemary said to me something that really surprised me. She said, I'm going to pray. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. And then she said, no, 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 I'm going to pray right now. As in right, right now. Standing in the bedroom, she said she's going to pray. Well, when Rosemary prayed, she prayed a, heart, a prayer from the depths of her heart because she knew I was in trouble. So therefore, being married, we were in trouble. And I reckon she prayed a prayer and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Mary and the whole gang of heaven stood to attention. Because it was a prayer that some of you have prayed, that prayer that comes from the point of complete and utter despair. When you know you have nothing else. Here's Jonah. Go to Nineveh, tell those people to stop behaving that way. And he turns on the presence of God and he walks in the opposite direction. And where does he end up? He ends up in this dark place in the belly of a whale because he was disobedient to what God had asked him to do. He'd walked away. There are some of you right now, you have walked away from things that you were meant to have done. The woman, the man that you were called to be. Oh, and sometimes it can be circumstances out of your control. Sometimes it couldn't be because you don't know what to do. And sometimes it can be because you choose to walk in the wrong direction. And so Rosemary prayed this prayer. And, and as she prayed this prayer, it changed my life. I still remember where we were, we were. It was vivid to me. And she began to pray this prayer and she said, you know, God in heaven, Will you come? Oh, I've told this story many times and yet it gets me all the time. She said to me, God in heaven, will you come? We're stuck. We don't know how to go on. We don't know what to do. And it's because Bruce is broken. No true words had ever been spoken. It was true. And then for some reason, Rosemary said to me, she said, let's go back right to that very beginning place. That day you were born. And she said to me, she said, I'm a Catholic. And she said, the promise of the Bible and the teaching of the church is that God is with us. He is never, never apart from us. And she said, I have to believe that he was in that room that day. That he was there. And she said to me, I want you to just imagine. She said, I know it's in your imagination. She said, I want you to imagine you're standing in the room and you're standing in the corner and, and there's the bed where you're born and there's where mum is, your mum is. And she said, Jesus has got to be in the room. She said, imagine you just pull back from the room and you see everything. And, and I know this was just in my imagination. I realised that. But, but I remember there leaning against the wall just was Jesus. He literally was just leaning like this. And there was I just having been born and he looked at me. And he looked at me with those eyes, you know, those eyes that see everything. And he said to me, you're all right. It's going to be okay. And that was all. And I remember, I remember as I prayed, it was almost like a flood came upon me where all of a sudden, all of that hurt and those years of feeling that I didn't measure up, that I didn't measure up to my family, I didn't measure up to me, I didn't measure up to anybody I was at school and all the places I'd been, I didn't measure up to the people I worked with. Somehow it all disappeared in a rush. And I was just left with peace. And I most certainly wouldn't be here today 
if it wasn't for that moment and that prayer, that God turned up and God came. And it changed my life. Now, I've sometimes said to God, God, why did you let that happen? Why did, you, why did you let that happen? And to be honest with you, I don't know. But what I do know is I believe right now because I had such a powerful encounter. And there are many of you who are just in that exact place right now. God will come to you. And it could be for a whole variety of things, couldn't it? It could be the colour of your skin. Could be things that people have said to you. Could be shortcomings, health issues. Could be intelligence. Could be opportunity. Could be personality. Could be the fact that you know uh, you don't know why, but just life is tough and life seems dark. And I've come to say to you in these days that God can come to you. Why does God let things happen? Why? Some years ago, I was director of, going back many years now, I was director of young adult ministry for the Archdiocese. And we were doing this event. We had 436 kids and I was with them in this auditorium and we had planned that I was going to give a talk on disappointment. And, and because we wanted to make it a bit visual and dramatic, what we'd done is got these old-fashioned alarm clocks and, and I was going to make seven points about disappointment and I put them on the stage and I started the first the talk and I made the first point about disappointment and the alarm began to ring and I said you know we can't allow disappointments of yesterday to get in the way of us being able to hear God's voice and I got a sledgehammer at that point in time and I smashed the clock and then someone came along and they put a second clock there I had had another six to go and and then I began to give and I began to talk again about, you know, have you ever been in a place where you felt helpless? And I was staring out at all of these young adults, all in their 20s, late teens and in their 20s. And I remember looking up and, and, and as I began to look up, this entire room had just begun crying. Some of them were weeping. One in four girls in this country have been abused in some way. One in five boys. You know? And here they are in this place of darkness, but they had no one to tell. I, didn't, I broke that clock and then we didn't do any more because we couldn't go on. Because so many of them felt in a place of where they were, were alone. And so I began to pray for them that day. Why does God allow things to happen to us the way he does? About 15 years ago, I decided that I was going to go out to the movies with Rosemary. And I picked a movie that Rosemary would like, you know, something with lots of violence, where lots of people get, lots of buildings get exploded, you know, the movies that kind of Rosemary would like. And I bought tickets and we hadn't been out for a while and went to the movies. And just before we're about to leave, we get a phone call from our son-in-law. And earlier in the day, we had heard that our oldest daughter was having a baby and that she'd gone into labour. And we, and, and we were uh, uh, ready for it, but there was nothing that we could do. And so we decided we would go to the movies and we got called where we obviously would leave and if we were wanted. Well, we get a phone call not long before we're meant to go. And the phone call occurs and, uh, and it's our son-in-law, Ronan. And he says, listen, he said, uh, the baby's been born, but something's not right. And he said, uh, he said, the hospital has said that the grandparents should come immediately. Well, we obviously didn't go to the movies. We headed straight there. And, and I vividly remember standing in, in, up in the children's area. And, and at that point in time, they didn't know what was wrong. Uh, when she was six days old, she had, she had uh, heart surgery. And what became evident is that she was, in the way uh, my daughter and son-in-law describe it, she was in, she's been intellectually delayed. She didn't walk until she was nearly 
eight, nine years of age. She can't overly feed herself herself. She can't talk. And yet she is beautiful in every way. And she has changed my life and the life of all the people who love her and her around her. But to Ronan and Emma, they work hard and have sacrificed much. This beautiful girl. Why is it that God permits hardship to come into our life? Why is it that sometimes we have to get into dark places to be reached? Why? It's because God sometimes wants to use those things to reach our very heart, to reach the place in us that's truthful, the place where we are our truest self. And whilst God doesn't necessarily cause any of those things, the scripture tells us he uses those things for himself because he wants to draw us to him. There are some of you, God is saying to you that there's some things he wants of you. And what does that mean? He wants you to come into his presence because his presence is where his will is for you. For some of you, he wants you to be successful in business. He wants you to make money, to employ people. And you've known for a long time you had a heart for business, but you just haven't developed it to the way you should. There are some of you, God's got particular study he wants you to do. There's some of you that God wants you to be parents. God wants you to get married. God wants you to do all these things. And you, there are things that you're meant to do. God wants for some of you to be a certain kind of person. God's asking some of you that you would sacrifice things and do what he, he asks of us to lay our lives down. But it's hard. Lent is a time when we look at what God is asking of us. We look at where his presence is and we walk towards his presence. And so here is Jonah and Jonah is putting all sorts of things before God. For me, one of my idols, what, what does it say in, in, in chapter, um, uh, chapter, verse 8, sorry? Those who worship vain idols forsake their true identity. What was my idol? My idol was I wanted to be, I wanted to be happy. Uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to be popular. I wanted to fit in. And yet I didn't. Well, so I thought, which was in my own mind. What is it today that you've put in your life before God? Is it to be a parish priest of a successful parish? Is that what you've put before God? Is it good looks? Is it money? Is it power? Is it prestige? Is it a sense within your own heart that you are better than others? What is it that you put before God? That this Lent you need to let go? What is it? I never thought this ministry would turn out to be what it was quite in the way that it's developed, I didn't. I always had a sense that I was meant to share the gospel as far as I could. I thought that. Well, some years ago, a number of archbishops approached me, or bishops and archbishops approached me, and asked if I would go to parishes to speak. And at, the t and, and at, at first, I wasn't sure that that was such a good idea. I, I didn't know whether it was good or not. And slowly, as I began to do things here, what ha happened is that in the eastern states, in other states of the country, invitations kept coming. And slowly we started to pursue those, thinking that's what we're meant to do. Well, it got to a point where I was on the road for 25 to 26 weeks of the year. And sometimes when we were recording for television, I would fly in on a, on a Saturday afternoon, I'd record on a Sunday morning, and then I'd go straight from there to the airport, and I'd be home for less than 24 hours, and then I was away. And even though I travelled with a team of people, much, sometimes the team was able to change over and some would come on some trips with me, some would, others would not, but I had to go on all of them. And even though I was surrounded both by a wonderful team and I was surrounded in the parishes where I was with, with beautiful people in every place I went, you're alone. You're alone. And at the end of every talk or session, as the months rolled on, you just go back to the place you're staying, the hotel you're staying, the room you're staying, and you were by yourself. 
And I did this for a year, two years, three years, and away all the time and just flying and flying and flying and going to another city, another town, another place. Invitations just kept coming. And, 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 I, and I had felt, as I've shared, that, that God wanted me to share the gospel everywhere. But I began to get tighter and tighter because my focus was on me. And one, one Saturday afternoon, I flew back to Perth and Rosemary came to the airport to pick me up. And she picked me up at the airport and when she saw me, she immediately knew something was up. And I remember she said to me, we need to have a chat, a talk. And when we got, home, when we got, we got back home and we sat down to talk, she said to me, she said, what's up? And I said, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I said, I'm living away from you and our kids and our grandkids. You know, and I'm, I'm in places all the time and I'm alone. I'm alone. And I don't want to go anymore. God, God can choose someone else. And I remember Rosemary looked at me and she said to me, uh, when I first met you, you told me that you felt that's what you, God wanted you to do with your life, not just your time, but your life. And she said to me, she said, yeah, you can stay here with us. And she said, I would love to have you home. And she said to me, the kids would love to have you home. The grandkids would love to have you home. And she said, for a time, you'll be happy. You'll be happy. But she said, in time, you would become less of the person that God has called you to be. I said, what? She said, in time, if you stay home, you'll become less of the person that God has called you to be. And it will affect our marriage because you won't be who God called you to be. It will affect you as a parent because you won't be who God called you to be. And it will affect you within yourself because it's not who God called you to be. She said, you know what God has asked you to do. You know where his presence is. And his presence sometimes where he asks us to go is not the places where he, where we would want to go. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Next day I had to, I, I went and did the recording I had to do and then we drove to the airport and I got my bags and I was walking away because I was booked to go somewhere else. And as I walked away, I started walking away and she called to me from the car. And she said, come back here, come back here. And I went back and talk about truth being spoken, truth. She looked at me and she said to me, now you walk into that airport. And she said, you get, hop on that plane, you get on that plane. And she said, you fly away from us and you live your life apart from us. And you go share with people who Jesus is. And she said, you know why? because it's what Jesus has asked you to do. And we will miss you, but you will be in his presence and so will we. And I remember when I looked at her in the car park of the airport walking away, that she had told the truth. There are some of you who are listening to me. God is asking you to do some things that are difficult. He's asking you to change that bad temper that you have. He's asking you to do something about that marriage that you've allowed to become dry. He's asking you to do something about that job where you're just drifting. He's asking you to do something about that business that He called you into and put you into that you're just going through the routine with. He's asking you to do something with that child that you have that's difficult. He's asking you to give forgiveness to that person who has so incredibly hurt you and sees no wrong in what they've done, but they were wrong. He's asking you to forgive them. See, it's in the dark place. It's in the hard place where God calls us and we find Him and we meet Him. And so Jonah in verse nine, verse 9 says, But I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. 
What he says is, I'll do what you've asked me to do. I'll go in the direction of Nineveh. I will tell those people in Nineveh that they are behaving wrongly and they should not. I'll do what you ask me to do. I'll, I'll, do where, I'll go where you want me to go. And in verse 10, it says there in the final verse, it says this, And then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out of the dry land. Where? Into the light. It's interesting that when we follow God and we do what God asks of us, it may be hard. It may have been in the darkness that He called us, but it always leads us to stand in the light of where we are. Lent is a moment in our lives. It's a season in our life that the church gives us and says, look at your life. Look at your life. Are you in my presence by doing what I've called you to do? And that will be different to, to one person, to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. Loving Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, there are so many people listening to the sound of my voice. Lord God, and to every one of them, you are saying to them, come into my presence. Come into my presence. And where's your presence? It's doing what you ask of us to do at the age we are, at the stage we are in life. And it is so different for each of us from someone else. Lord, allow us as we're in this Lenten journey, as we come to church, as we celebrate Eucharist, as we celebrate sacraments, Lord, may we come to that place of encountering You more deeply where we can say, I've taken up my cross. I'm walking in the direction that You're calling me to be. And this is what true happiness is. This is what peace is. Lord God, come to us in these days. And Father, we make this prayer in Jesus' name through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. As we conclude today, I want to ask you, will you help me share Jesus with more people? The truth is many people don't go to church today. Many people have given up. The truth is also that many people go to church and for many, they don't really connect with who Jesus is and who God is and his plan and love for them. And the reality is, is that many of you have helped me reach people all over the world. All of our Faith Builder partners, the people who've gone into our website set up in a way where they give every month, make it possible for more and more people to hear about the message of Jesus. To all everyone who gives from time to time, you make it possible to hear about Jesus. Jesus is the hope of the world. And so I want to encourage you today in your giving to know that you are blessed when you give that God says that he blesses us as we give. And to ask you if you would seriously consider standing with us if you have not so far and enable us to reach even more people today. This is an important hour in our, our lives and in the world. And I'm asking if you will help us to share Jesus with more people everywhere. You can go to our website or you can go to the Give tab and I pray that it blesses you. Loving Father, we give you thanks today that you are so abundantly good. And Lord, there are so many people who will never hear about you unless we take the message of the gospel. That's what you said. You said, go into all the world. And Lord, we do that in many different ways. Some of us go, some of us give, some of us make it possible. And Lord, together, we're all the body of Christ. Help us today to share with another person and another person. And can this land right in the laps of people, oh Lord God, who maybe weren't expecting it, and may it touch their lives and draw them to a deeper love of you. And Father, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining uh, with everybody. I pray wherever you are that you know that God is with you wherever you are around the world. <laughs>